All right, good morning and happy Wednesday, all you magnificent melon heads. Happy Fed Day, everybody. Today, May 3rd, 2023, we just got the ADP private payrolls report came out a few minutes ago. It was kind of a shocker, folks. 296,000 jobs, private sector jobs added in the last month. I don't think anybody was expecting a number anywhere near that big. And I'll be honest with you, I was talking with, over with Mish about this. It didn't make a whole lot of sense to me. Every day, more layoffs, another round of layoffs, another few hundred today. We even got another one, another software company in San Francisco laying off 600 people today. Where are all these jobs coming from? We'll get into that in a little bit. But you know what? This gives Jerome Powell all the cover he needs for another rate hike today, doesn't it? Jerome Powell can now point to this ADP jobs report in his press conference today with his pre-screened scripted questions because journalism isn't a thing anymore. And he can say, look, ADP said 296,000 jobs. The economy remains strong and resilient. And so he's going to hike again today. Market is pricing in almost a near certainty of a rate hike today. It's going to go down in history as a colossal mistake because banks are still failing, even though they assure us seemingly every day. They tell us how, whew, that crisis was over. Thank goodness. How many times have we been told the crisis was over? How many headlines have we seen like J.P. Morgan bails out First Republic ending banking crisis or deposit outloads, outflows have stabilized, crisis averted? How many times has the financial press and the bank regulators and the politicians declared this crisis over and yet here we are still going on? And yesterday, the regional banks, it didn't get many headlines. There were some, but the regional banks got slaughtered yesterday. A handful of them down more than 10%, several over 20%. And, uh, you know, here we are. We're going to hike interest rates again today. And reminder, folks, it's the hiking of interest rates, the most rapid pace of rate tightening in history that is causing these banks to fail. When you increase interest rates, you lower the value of debt instruments, bonds, mortgages, you name it. Their values go down when rates go up. And the Fed keeps raising rates, driving those values down. That's making these banks further insolvent. Now, I want to emphasize further insolvent because all banks are, by definition, insolvent. Joe Brown over at Heresy Financial did a fantastic video about this yesterday. I encourage you guys to go watch it. And he basically said, look, First Republic Bank failed because it's a bank. There was nothing really unique about its business model, yet its mortgages were particularly frothy, if you, if you want to use that word. Um, but there was nothing particularly special and unique about First Republic Bank's business model, or Silicon Valley for that matter. Fractional reserve banks are by definition insolvent. And as long as nobody wants their money back, it works. As soon as people want their money back, it fails. And right now, with what the Fed is doing, raising rates again, and they'll use this ADP payrolls number as an excuse to raise rates again, they're going to make these banks more insolvent than they already are. So let's shrink my big melon of a head, and let's get into what's going on in markets this morning, shall we? The S&P 500 is up seven points today, basically flat at 4,126. The Dow is up 46, again, basically flat, 0.14%, 33,731. And the NASDAQ is up about the same, about 0.2%, up 22 points at 12,103. So stock's not doing a whole lot this morning, kind of sitting and waiting. The dollar, the USDXY, that's the dollar measured against a basket of other currencies, is down 42 basis points at 101.53, still floating in that 101 to 102 range where it's been for the better part of a month and a half now. Not sure where it wants to go. I'm still leaning towards Dixie going higher. World government bonds right now, we've got the U.S., the yield curve, a little bit higher on the short end. We've got the one month is up six basis points at 4.45. The 10-year is at 3.39, down about five basis points. We've got further inversion in the yield curve today, folks, with the short end higher than the long end. The bond market has been telling us for well over a year that something bad is coming. Looking over into the commodity space, we've got gold is up about three bucks today, back over 2000 at 2026. Had a pretty good day yesterday. Silver also had a good day yesterday, currently at 25.55, up about, I'm sorry, down six cents this morning. Crude oil, check this one out, 69.23. Back to a six handle on crude oil, down another $2.46, or 3.43% today. That's WTI crude. 
And check out this oil chart. This is going back to about last summer, still heading lower. And look at this breakdown. You know, back below, we came up here, we bounced right off the 200 day moving average, and we've headed down ever since. Now, a lot of people got very bullish oil after that April surprise from OPEC Plus when they announced that they were cutting production. And I remember seeing that, and I was surprised by the production cut. It was a little bit of a political middle finger to the United States. But the other, the reason I didn't jump on that bullish oil bandwagon at that point was because I suspected it might have been OPEC just getting out in front of a severe recession. And I'm still leaning towards that. I'm seeing the oil numbers and a lot of the manufacturing numbers and a lot of the jobs numbers support this, ADP notwithstanding. Um, the world is using less oil, or at least the demand for oil is starting to fall behind the supply. The price is falling, folks. And severe recessions, you get less oil consumption. So I don't think that OPEC price cut was really ever going to send prices higher. It was really just avoiding prices going lower. And it hasn't worked. We're back in the 60s now. But here's the cover story today, private payrolls. All right, now I want to emphasize ADP is not a government number. This is a private sector organization, folks. So this is not government propaganda here. I, I'm, I'm believing these numbers. I'm in disbelief. But I have no reason to suspect ADP is lying here for any political reason. Private payroll surged by 296,000 in April, much higher than expected, ADP says. Private payrolls rose by 296,000 for April, above the downwardly revised 142,000 from the previous month, but well ahead of the estimate for 133,000. Fastest job growth in April came in, of course, leisure and hospitality with a gain of 154,000 followed by education and health services with 69,000 and construction with 53,000. The financial sector lost 28,000 jobs. Manufacturing also took a hit, losing 38,000 jobs. So it's good to know that as software engineers and bankers and traders lose their jobs, they can still get a job as a barista or a hotel maid or a bellboy because that's what's happening. The economy is shedding high-wage jobs and the economy is adding Low wage jobs, not a good sign for the consumer, not a good sign for the average person's income. And we also got a lot of employment data yesterday. Uh, well, here's the ADP number. We're going to skip over that one here. Check out U.S. job openings. We got the JOLTS report yesterday. And this the number of openings has kind of been an outlier. We've been around 11, 10 million for the better part of a year and a half. Well, yesterday that number came down. The number of job openings in the United States dropped by 384,000 to 9.6 million in March, All right? So if we look at a longer term chart of this, let's go to like a five year chart. You can see the number of job openings here. It's still historically high, much higher than before the pandemic. But I've talked about this a while. I think these numbers are skewed higher now because of work from home and because of remote work, you see multiple postings of the same job. So this chart is skewed higher but clearly a trend down in the number of job openings in the United States. And we also saw a slowdown in the number of job quits. Remember the great resignation? Well, it's still going on, but it is coming to a close. The number of job quits in the United States decreased by 129,000 from the previous month to 3.85 million. Now that was in March, the lowest level since May of 2021 and below the record peak of roughly four and a half million that was reached in November of 2021. So the number of people quitting their job is slowing down, it's slowing down rapidly. Again, looking at a five-year chart, we are still historically high above where we were going into the pandemic, but the number is coming down rapidly. And Zero Hedge kind of pointed this out this morning about why this chart is looking at the change in pay for jobs. All right. The blue chart, the blue line, that is the change in annual pay for people who are changing jobs. If you quit one job and you go to another place, at this point, you're getting about a 13% raise if you do that, whereas about a, you know, a year, six months ago, you were getting 15 or 16% pay increase. So the benefit of quitting your job and going and getting another one is coming down rapidly. We're also seeing the, annual, the change in annual pay is starting to slow for people who stay in their job. This is saying, this number may, seems a little high to me, but they're saying if you stay at your job, you're going to get a 6.7% raise, where a few months ago it might have been 7, 7.5. Uh, those numbers, it's, it seems skewed a little bit high, but you can see the benefit of quitting your job and going and looking for another one is rapidly coming down because the number of job postings is coming down. 
So the job market, a lot of the data shows that the job market is slowing, and that's why I'm scratching my head at this ADP number this morning. It just seems like an outlier to me. Doesn't matter, though. Jerome Powell's going to look at that, and he's going to say, all clear, let's go hike rates. And uh, by the way, I mentioned we've still got it. Layoffs still coming in. Another one today. Unity conducts its third largest, third and largest round of layoffs this year. Software companies move to let go about 600 employees, follows a string of job cuts in the tech industry and beyond. So another San Francisco tech company laying off hundreds of people. We've seen this story play out all year so far, and it's still going on another one today. All right. Now, this article in Yahoo Finance this morning, we're going shifting gears to the banks now because that is still a thing, folks. And this article is kind of scary here. All right. Just released two, uh, released yesterday morning. Half of America's banks are potentially insolvent. This is how credit crunch begins. All right. And really, it's not half. It's technically all of them are insolvent by definition. But this is saying half of America's banks are treacherously, dangerously insolvent. And they're going to stop lending. The twin crashes in U.S. commercial real estate and the U.S. bond market have collided with $9 trillion of uninsured deposits in the American bank system. Such deposits can vanish in an afternoon in the cyber age. The second and third, and I'd add the fourth, biggest bank failures in U.S. history have followed in quick succession. The U.S. Treasury and Federal Reserve would like us to believe that they're idiosyncratic. That's a dangerous evasion. These bank failures... Yes, there are some unique attributes about each one of these banks, but these banks are all failing for the same reason, the rapid pace of rate hikes devaluing their assets. That's why these banks are failing. Almost half of America's 4,800 banks are already burning through their capital buffers. They may not have to mark all losses to market under U.S. accounting rules, but that does not make them solvent. And I love this line. Somebody will take those losses. Read it again, folks. Read it again, all you folks in Washington. You need to see this. This is the one takeaway from this. Somebody will take those losses. You cannot avoid it. All right? You can move it around. You can spread it around. You can even it out. There is no avoiding these losses. They're already there. The bankers can take them. The wealthy can take them. The poor can take them. Everyone can take them. The government can take them but somebody's got to take it. Somebody has to hold this bag. And so far, the answer has been to socialize those losses among the public through either higher fees paid by banks into the FDIC, because they're going to have to raise the fees the FDIC charges banks to make up for the losses in the deposit insurance fund. That means you're going to take these losses by paying higher ATM fees, higher minimum balance fees, (coughs) excuse me, or You could take these losses in the form of your taxes, or you could take these losses in the form of inflation, driving up your cost of living while your wages remain stagnant. Either way, somebody will take those losses. Seems like people are pretending like, oh, you know, we can just pass a law or we can just do a thing or we could just make another Fed program and then nobody loses money. It's magic. See, nobody ever loses money. Oh, I know what we'll do, and I've talked about this before. There's going to be another acronym coming from the Fed. They're going to call it the Commercial Real Estate Asset Program. Commercial Real Estate Asset Purchase Program. That's right. Why let a bubble deflate? Why let the free and fair market determine the value of assets that nobody really needs anymore? Why do that when you can just print money and park that crap on the Fed's balance sheet? And that's probably what they're going to end up doing. But again, somebody will take those losses. In that case, it would be you taking those losses because that will be inflationary and you'll suffer the cost through higher cost of living. And looking at some of these banks right now, this is still ongoing, folks. Let's see what we got this morning. We have got PacWest Bancorp. Oh, they're actually doing pretty well, up 7.3% after being down 27.8% yesterday. So a little bit of a bounce in the banks this morning. Western Alliance is back up 5%. They were down 15.1% yesterday. Metropolitan Bancorp. They were down 20.4% yesterday. Let's give them a refresh. They are currently up 7%. So it looks like the regional banks are getting a reprieve this morning, bouncing back off their losses yesterday. Home Street was down 14.5%. They're down another 3.5% today. We've got Harbor One. They were down yesterday by about 11.4%. Today, they're up 3%. And the Spider Sector Regional Bank ETF, 
This one was down 6.3% yesterday. It's up about 1.3 this morning. So things are looking a little bit better in the regional banks this morning, but not by a whole much, certainly not making up for all the losses yesterday. And I have a thank you to send to Mr. Kevin DeBella. Thank you very much, sir, for the super chat and the support of the channel. He says, why would they stop now or try to save the system and economy? The more banks fail and the more money they have to print, the better their case for CBDCs. Well, Kevin, first of all, you're absolutely right. I do think where this is eventually going is CBDCs. Um, I'd add one more caveat to your list of reasons why they wouldn't stop now. Because the big banks are making out like bandits here. JP Morgan is going to make billions off of that First Republic bailout. I mean, they are going to make so much money. <clears throat> Excuse me, guys. I'm sorry about the sore throat. It's, we're, we're in the final innings of it. But JP Morgan, look, eventually, as these banks continue to fail, eventually the Fed will turn the switch and they'll start lowering interest rates. And when they lower interest rates, all these assets that the big banks are buying up for pennies on the dollar right now are going to go right back up in value. When they lower rates, they increase the price of debt instruments, mortgages, bonds, CMBS, all of it. And the Fed will be forced to lower rates. It's coming. At some point, a lot of people are betting this year. The market is actually betting in or pricing in three rate hikes before the end of the year. We could get three rate hikes before the end of the freaking quarter, guys, that the rate things are going. And when that happens, all these, all these debt instruments, all these assets that J.P. Morgan is buying up for pennies and getting free insurance from the FDIC when they do it, they're going to go right back up in value. The big banks are getting bigger. They're making out like bandits here. So this is just driving consolidation in the banking industry. J.P. Morgan broke the law when they bought up First Republic Bank, and all the regulators approved it. J.P. Morgan is bigger than the law says they're allowed to be. They're more than 10% of all deposits in the United States now. And everybody just let it happen. Nobody even batted an eyelash. The whole point of Dodd-Frank was to make sure no bank was ever too big to fail, ever again. Too big to fail was a disaster, and we couldn't let it happen again. Well, apparently Silicon Valley Bank was too big to fail under the systemic risk exemption. Apparently, Signature Bank was too big to fail under the systemic risk exemption. And now First Republic Bank was too big to fail under the systemic risk exemption. And so the solution is to let J.P. Morgan get even bigger? So why would they stop, Kevin? You're right. They won't stop because it's driving more consolidation. And when the whole banking sector has consolidated into these six or seven behemoths, that's when the Fed rolls out the central bank digital cur currency, and that's when they control everything, every aspect of your life. So why would they stop? That's a good question. Why would they stop? And I could say the only solution in that case would be to unbank yourself. That's why I make regular purchases of gold, silver, and Bitcoin. I'm less worried about the day-to-day -day price fluctuations in those assets, and I'm more worried about Kevin DeBella's scenario here where the banks just continue to consolidate and they take over every aspect of our life and they try to control what we do with our own money. They can't do that if your money is physical, precious metals, or Bitcoin. So thank you very much, Kevin. I appreciate the super chat, sir, and the support of the channel. You are a gentleman and a scholar. Folks, it is Fed Day. The FOMC press conference starts at 2.30, and I will be going live at 2.15 for Jerome Powell's press conference right here on Nobody Special Finance. If you're new to the channel, please like and subscribe. And also today at 7 p.m. is our Zoom call for Patreon. Thank you to my Patreon supporters for everything you guys do for the channel. We're going to have plenty to talk about by tonight after Powell's press conference, after another day of wild trading in bank stocks. Who knows what we'll be talking about tonight? Link down below to Patreon should you feel so inclined. Hi, Mom. Hi, Dad. I love you guys. And until next time, live small and dream big.